Well, good afternoon. So good to be back with you and share with you from God's Word. I want to read again our key verses from 1 Timothy chapter 3 uh, that we have uh, been using as a basis for our study together this weekend, verse 14 down to verse 16. And then I want to read from chapter 6 and verse 3 just to catch us up to speed where we ended last night. So 1 Timothy 3, verse 14, please, and it says this, But these things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. And then please, if you'll turn with me to chapter six and verse three, it says, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine, which is according to godliness. We'll read on. He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings. So God will bless that reading of his precious word to us uh, this afternoon. I want to just kind of do a little bit of a, a quick review. We, we said that the key verse in 1 Timothy is chapter 3, verse 15, and it's all about how to behave in the house of God. And I think it's really important that we recognize uh, that when we come together in church capacity, house of God capacity, if you like. We're living stones, and we come together as house of God. Uh, we need to recognize, first of all, whose house it is. That, that's a game changer. It's not our house. It's his house, house of God. And so it's interesting. I just came back from Canada, and uh, I was in uh, Quebec, and um, it's cold up there, and uh, it snows a lot, and they have a lot of salt on the roads. So the houses that I stay in, usually when I'm in Canada, one of the house rules is you take your shoes off at the door. Yeah, you do not come in because you bring that salt with you. And if they got carpets, they get rotted or whatever. You just, that's the house rules. Now in Missouri, where we live, you come to our house, you don't have to take your shoes off. We don't have snow there, not often. Thank the Lord. We don't have that stuff. So, so you, you don't have to do that. So, so I want you to just get the idea. I respect the rules of the houses of my Canadian brethren. I'm not just going to march in there because I do it at home and say, well, I, I, I don't take my shoes off at home. I'm going to come in with my shoes on. No, I respect their house rules. And when it's the house of God, we have to recognize that he has the absolute right to set the rules of behavior and conduct in his house. And so once I understand that, I don't have a difficulty. I'm thankful that I can be part of house of God. I can actually uh, have a part of this. And if he says, this is what you got to do, and this is how you conduct yourself, I'm not going to argue. I say, well, praise the Lord. Okay, Lord, I'm just glad to be part of this. And so I think it's really important we understand that, the behavior in the house of God. But then we said that as we look at 1 Timothy, every chapter can be looked at in connection with house of God. And we're going to see that a little bit today. We're going to see in chapter 1, uh, the house of God and its gospel. Uh, we'll, we'll hopefully get into chapter 2, the house of God at prayer. And we'll get into the end of chapter 2, the house of God and gender roles. We're going to see that uh, each chapter, the house of God has a bearing on how we look at that chapter, how we understand it and interpret that chapter. But then we said, as you study a book like Timothy, one of the things that's always good in Bible study is observation. And you're looking out for repeated words and phrases. And we, we observed as we went through that one of the repeated uh, words is faith, the faith, as was pointed out uh, by our brother leading the singing there, the faith. And what's interesting about it is that most of the references are negative. It's people that are departing from the faith, uh, that uh, concerning the faith making shift. 
shipwreck, uh, having cast off their first faith. And so it, it's all negative references that, in other words, it, it, there's, a, there's, a, there's a difficulty that people are abandoning ship. And the reason they're abandoning ship is because in the latter days, Paul told us that they would be these doctrines of demons and all the rest of it, and they're going to influence people. And so what's his solution? Well, we saw that he does have an answer. And what he said is the, the answer, the solution is sound doctrine, healthy doctrine. That is the solution to this problem we find. And then we got to our final reference uh, uh, as we went through and looked at references to doctrine. And we, again, we traced the word doctrine through the epistle. And we came to this one, chapter 6, verse 3, where it talks about doctrine, which is according to godliness. And that's where we left off last night. What we said is that how do we tell whether doctrine is healthy? Well, you, you see that it's healthy because of what it produces in the lives of those that are under that doctrine. There will be evidence in the life, and one of the greatest evidence will be godliness. It, it, sound, healthy doctrine will, as a definite result of it, will produce will produce godly living. And we said it's possible uh, if doctrine is not <laughs> healthy, if it's false doctrine, it'll actually make the saints sick. But if it's hygienic, healthy doctrine, it will produce godliness in them. And so we've got to uh, ask ourselves the question. We might say this, the burden of this epistle is that God's truth, if rightly taught and held, will produce godly living, and it will also curb the de defections from the faith. And so that's why one of the responsibilities of shepherds is feeding the flock of God. They're, they're meant to be spiritual dietitians, and they may be, be, better be sure that they're giving the saints that which is going to produce health and well-being in them. And godliness in their character, right? Is, is it going to produce that? And, and so uh, ever so often, the elders need to meet together and say, well, how are we doing? Like, are the saints being properly fed? Are they getting a healthy diet? Are they growing in godliness? And if not, we, we might need to revise what we're teaching, right? We need, to, we need to ask ourselves. So often we just do things the way we've always done it, business as usual, and we don't ask any hard questions. And we need to start asking hard questions. Is this spiritual food promoting growth and well-being in the saints? Are they healthy? Are they godly? And so we want to just trace this idea of godliness through uh, the epistle. Now, what we, I suppose it's good to define what we're talking about when we talk about godliness. Uh, it's kind of interesting that um, we have, when you see words like godly, you could think, how does that all work? So let me just give you an example. We used to have this, this term, manly. Have you ever heard that before? He's very manly. What does that mean? Like he's masculine. He, he, he looks like a guy should look like. And then we'd say, well, she's very womanly. What do we mean by that? Well, she's very feminine. She looks like a woman should look. Now, that's, that's kind of almost... Have you noticed how the masculine, masculine of men, or the masculization of men in our culture today? Uh, men looking more feminine every single day, and women looking more masculine every day. You know, God is not the author of confusion. Where's all that coming from? Satan, right? That's where it's coming from. And you, you see it. And uh, I used to say to my son, James, lived in Norway. And, and uh, I said, you know, why are all these men wearing tights? Because they, they wear such skinny jeans. It's a wonder they can breathe. You know, I mean, and, and it's this emasculization of them. You know, you can see it in the culture. And, and, uh, and, and then women with skinhead haircuts. You know, I mean, uh, skinhead meant something in England when I was growing up. It was a, it was a kind of a, uh, a tough guy kind of thing. It was a gang thing, you know. And now you see, ladies, uh, it's just, anyway, um, don't get me sidetracked. Uh, well, all I'm trying to say is this. Manly means manlike. Godly means, uh, well, sorry, womanly means womanlike. So what does godliness mean? 
something about that person will remind you of God. God likeness. That's the idea of godliness. Now, sometimes, uh, like Darby translates it, piety, uh, lots of different ways, but it's, it's the idea of that, which is doing that which is well pleasing to God, which would even remind people of God. And so that's what we need to see produced in the lives of the saints. And unless we're taught about him, uh, we'll never reverence him. We'll never, we'll never know what he is like so that we might be like him in terms of our character and ways. And so doctrine that produces godliness, that's what we're looking for. So let's just look through the epistle and see the references to godliness, just to see this pattern again, uh, that, that this is a kind of dominant idea in the epistle. So uh, when we get to chapter two and verse two, uh, we're talking about the prayer meeting and part of the things that we pray for in the prayer meeting, and that is for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet, and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. And so what he's saying is this, that part of the reason that we, we pray for those in authority is that we might enjoy peaceable and tranquil conditions so that we might not pursue the American dream, right? That's not what he's saying, but that we might pursue godliness, that we might be, be use that freedom to, to grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus and have more godliness mark our character. That's what, that's what it's about. And, and so we've got to see that. And you saw it's kind of interesting. I would imagine if you were living uh, in Ukraine right now in, in that particular area, I forget what it is, where it's under attack. Uh, I'm not a news hound. Some of you that are would be able to tell me immediately what I'm talking about. But, but I know there's one area right now, and they're under full Russian assault. And I would imagine that if you're a believer and you live in that area, your main thought today is not how do I become more Christ-like? It's how do I survive? How do I get food? How do I get water? How, how do I protect my family from being blown to smithereens? You know, in other words, it, when you're in a hostile environment, your number one thought is survival. We're not in a hostile environment. Praise God for that. We, we have a measure of peace and quiet and tranquility in our Western society. Thank the Lord for that. So what are we doing with it? Are we using it to grow in godliness? You see, and that's what he says, We're praying that we, we might live a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. And that's what we should be looking for. Uh, and not life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, life, liberty, and the pursuit of holiness. That should be our goal. So chapter 2, verse 10, but that which be becometh women professing godliness with good works. And it's thinking about the woman's deportment and what should stand out about a woman. And what it's saying is, wouldn't it be wonderful if, if that woman's character was such that every time you saw her, she reminded you of God. That's a beautiful thing, isn't it? There was a woman uh, during a revival in Edinburgh, Scotland. Her name was Mrs. Binney. And this is what was said about Mrs. Binney. It says she was a woman who lived in habitual communion with God. Now, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing to have said about you? Here's a woman that lives in, and she, somehow God revealed to her a revival was coming to Edinburgh, Scotland, before anybody saw it. And, and she was in such communion with God, it seemed like God revealed the secrets to it. He said, revival's coming. She was telling everybody, get ready, revival is coming. And sure enough, it did. It, a great revival broke out in Edinburgh, Scotland. And Mrs. Binney was telling people, not from a platform, but just personally, get ready, revival's coming. And so, again, uh, women professing godliness. Uh, chapter 3, verse 16. Uh, this is part of our key verse. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. And, and basically, we're going to look at this verse in more detail, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on it now. But, but if we really want to understand godliness, we've got to understand the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he goes on and says, God was manifest in the flesh. Justified in spirit, 
seen of angels, preached to the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. And so what he's saying is the real secret to, in other words, man can never be like God and ignore his son. You can't be godlike if you have nothing to do with the son of his love. You can't be like that. But the more captivated you are with the son, the more godly your life will be. Be taken up with this marvelous life that came into the world when God was manifesting the flesh. Be, be taken up with him. Look at chapter four. Well, we're going to kind of pause here a little bit because I doubt we're going to get to chapter four this weekend. Just so I'm going to kind of camp out here a little bit. But chapter four, verse seven, it says, refuse profane and old wives fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness for bodily exercise profiteth little but godliness is profitable unto all things having the promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come so he, what he's saying is if you want to be godly well there's something that's got to be refused you, you'll never be godly if you're constantly taken up with old wives fables right you've got to refuse them on the one hand. So, the, so let's just put it in a more general sense. There are things in, in our society, in our culture, that will never promote godliness in your life. It's a lot bigger now than old wives' fables. It's, it's just all over the TV, all over. The, I mean, it, the, the world is full of things that can cons consume your time that will never, ever produce godliness refuse them you got you got to make some choices here don't want that stuff that's not going to help me and it's a good thing to ask you you're going to you're going to watch a movie it, it, am i going to be able to have a prayer meeting once this movie's over right that's i always ask that question somebody asks, oh, will you come and watch this movie with us well okay we'll come and watch it but afterwards can we have a prayer meeting if it's going to make me want to pray if it's going to want to make me more christ-like i'm in let's come we, we, we want to watch it if it isn't Maybe I shouldn't be watching it. You see what I'm saying? Is it going to draw me closer to the Lord? That's a good question to ask. Is it going to make me more godly? And so refuse, certain things have to be refused. But then it says, exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Now, here's a couple of points. First of all, the word exercise there in the King James uh, is the Greek word gymnasio, which from which we get our English word gymnasium. And so the idea is this, that if I want to have a... Uh, Arnold, anybody still remember that guy, Arnold Schwarzenegger? Okay, if I wanted to have a, a body like that, obviously, I've still got a bit of work to do. I'm not quite there yet, but I'm never going to drift into that kind of body ever, right? I mean, if I just drift, what am I going to look like? You know, <laughs> I'm going to look like a, a big egg, you know? I mean, <laughs> it's going to be the opposite, right? So exercise is the idea of discipline yourself, go to the gym if you like, towards godliness. So can we say this? If you want to be godly, you will never drift into a godly life. In fact, let me guarantee you this. When you drift, you always drift away from the Lord. You never drift towards him. The current takes you away, not towards. And so what the Lord is saying to you and I is this. If you want to be godly, there are disciplines of the Christian life right? Like Bible reading. That's a discipline, right? It's very important discipline, what we call the quiet time. Prayer is incredibly disciplined, isn't it? I mean, I don't, maybe I'm the only one that has this problem, but when I get time to pray and I sit down to pray and I deliberately make time to pray, uh, immediately a to-do list comes into my head, all the stuff I've got to do and, uh, you know, and all this kind of, and you, certainly you're, you're having to pull yourself back right? You got to discipline yourself to pray. It's a great discipline. Uh, and, and sharing the faith is a discipline, right? Having tracks with you, uh, going out deliberately, saying, Lord, lead me to, you, to souls. You, you don't drift into that. It's a discipline. And so uh, how is the discipline in your Christian life? Are you disciplined towards godliness? Now, he says th there's, there's value in, in bodily exercise, it profits little. It means that there's some profit in it. And there is. We don't want to diminish that. 
But godliness is profitable for all things because it has promised for the life that now is and the one to come. I'll never, ever regret spending time in the presence of God, being disciplined in my quiet time, being disciplined in prayer. I'll never regret those things when I meet the Lord. Lord, I, I, I'm so embarrassed. I've spent way too much time with you. I should have been playing golf. I, I'm sorry, Lord. I just, I don't know why, but I, you're never going to say that. But there's a lot of things you're going to do when you see the Lord. You're going to say, what was I thinking? Why was I wasting time on that which didn't profit much at all? And so he says, exercise yourself rather to godliness. And so ask yourself, and maybe it's good to ask ourselves the question tonight. I think it's a very important question this afternoon. Are you drifting or are you disciplined? Now, I can't answer that for you. I don't know you well enough. I'm, I'm really glad. I hardly know anybody here. It's always an advantage not to know. But the Spirit of God knows, knows you, and knows whether you're in a drift mode right now or a disciplined mode right now. Are you drifting away from the Lord or are you disciplining yourself towards godliness? And maybe some of us need to get disciplined again. And again, it's, it's not, it should be a delight for us to meet the Lord and spend time with him. But sometimes you have to go through the discipline to get to the delight phase. Right? If I don't read my Bible, I'll never get those moments where the Word of God just jumps off the page at me, and I just am, I'm just having a marvelous time. There's some days I go there, and I read, and I ask myself, what did I just read? But there's other days, it just seems it's alive, it's living. And the daily discipline, you, you miss those alive days if you're not there on a regular basis. So the discipline yourself towards godliness. Uh, again, let's look at chapter six. We're just looking at godliness, how it's used. We've already seen verse three about the idea of doctrine, which is according to godliness. Look at verse five, uh, pursuit, uh, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of truth, supposing that gain is godliness from such withdraw yourself. In other words, have nothing to do with the health wealth preachers. They're false teachers. Stay away from them. But here's a great verse. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, I want to just think about both these verses. First of all, these false teachers suppose that gain is godliness. So they, they, they say that gain is, is godlike. In so other words, they're, they're giving this idea that God's all about getting, right? And that's what gain is godliness. That's what they're saying. God's all about getting. It's what he can get out of you. That's not the God I know in Scripture. What does it talk about in James? That, that, that the Father alights. Remember him? You know, that uh, uh, he's, what does he do? Every good and every perfect gift comes from above from the father of lights in whom there's no variableness or shadow of turning. So what does that tell me? God is a God of giving, not a God of getting, right? He's giving. And, and of course, we think of him giving. What was the thing that he gave, the thing that was most precious to him? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. So, so here are these people who are saying gain is godliness, and they're saying, if you want to be like God, you got to be getting all the time. Get, 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 get. And yet I say, that's not the God I know. God I know is giving all the time. He sends his rain on the righteous and the unrighteous alike, right? God is giving all the time. He gives, he gives men who even curse his name, he gives them breath and the facility to articulate speech. Is that not giving? God is giving. And so these false teachers, they're saying, if you want to be like God, it's all about getting. And the word of God is saying the very opposite. If you want to be like God, you be giving. Right? Christ gave himself for, for her, for the church. And if we're going to be like him, we're going to be giving, not getting, giving. And so then he goes on and says, godliness with contentment is great gain. Isn't it amazing? Our whole culture is geared to make us discontent. Isn't that right? You, you got a car, but then next year's model comes out. And 
every advertisement is designed to let you feel that, you know, you're going to be so much better off if you get the new model because it has bells and whistles that you don't have in the old model, right? And so up to this new model coming out, you were really happy in your car. You like your jalopy. You thought it was wonderful. But now this new model comes out and, and the advertisement saying you can never really be happy unless you get this new model. And, and so that's a whole of culture. That's how it's designed. It's to make us discontent. And so what a, what a rare thing it is. In fact, there's one Puritan writer. Uh, he's got a book, and it's called this, The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment. Isn't that a great title? And so godliness with contentment is great gain. So contrary to the culture that we live in, to be content because you've got the Lord. You have your eternal destiny all settled. You have the privilege of, of actually being an ambassador for, for the heavenly kingdom. You, uh, you're beginning to grow in grace and more Christ-likeness is seen in your life. That, that should cause you to be very, very contented. Are you content? Are you content with the Lord and what you have in him? Godliness with contentment is great gain. Verse 11. It says, but thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. So there's some things that the man of God has to flee, and there are some things that the man of God has to follow. And one of the things he wants to follow, and the idea is pursue, hotly pursue after this, flee quickly from this, but pursue hotly this. And what we're to, one of the things we're to pursue is godliness. We sing some lovely hymns of aspiration, oh, to be like thee, blessed redeemer, some of those greats. And, and they're hymns of aspiration to be like him, wanting to be more like him. And so make that your goal, uh, godliness. Desire that, uh, pursue it, follow after it righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. And so having looked at that general introduction, let's go, you know, we kind of trace those words through the book, faith, doctrine, godliness. I want us to go back to chapter three and verse 14 through 16 now. And we want to think about what the key verses are before in the next session, we look at the house of God and its gospel. So it says this in chapter three and verse 14 we've already read it these things write i unto thee hoping to come unto thee shortly but if i tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of god which is the church of the living god the pillar and ground of the truth so what he says is um, I'm, I'm hoping to come to you timothy uh, and to ephesus where you are and i'm hoping to come in, in a short time but but if i'm delayed this can't wait, okay? There, there are other things that obviously can wait, but this can't wait. If I tell you long, you need to know this, how you to behave in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. And, and I want to just say that sometimes there's truth in Scripture that can clearly wait. Uh, I want to give you examples. Look at Second Epistle of John just for a moment. We have a couple of occasions in John's writing where there was truth he wanted to convey to them, but it would wait. And so 2 John um, verse 12, 2 John 12, it says, having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. So in other words, he's got a lot more to say to them, but it's going, it can wait. I, I could put it on in this letter, but I'm going to wait. And I'm going to come and talk to you face to face. Second epistle, chapter, uh, sorry, third epistle, chapter, uh, verses 13 and 14. I had many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write unto thee, but I trust I shall shortly see thee, and we shall speak face to face. Peace be unto thee. Our friends salute thee, greet 
the friends by name. So again, here we've got this idea. It's more stuff he wants to convey to them. Uh, he, he could write it down, but it'll wait. He'll, he'll, he's going to wait till he comes and sees them, and he will tell them face to face. But Paul says, I'm hoping to come to see you soon. But he says, Timothy, this can't wait. This is so important. If I'm delayed, you need to know this, how to behave in the house of God. That tells us how important behavior in the house of God is. And, and we've already mentioned this, that, that it's his house. And, and I think it's really important to recognize that when we come together in assembly capacity, it's his house. He has the right to dictate the rules of the house. And we respect that. And we should have reverence for that. Uh, reverence for the house of God. Now, we're going to look on our final session on Sunday morning at the background to this chapter, which is Genesis 28. And we're going to develop that quite fully, but we're, I'm going to show the connection with Genesis 28, where you have the first mention of the house of God. But let's just remember, we need to have respect for the house of God and his telling us how we're to behave. Now, notice he says that you may know how to behave yourself in the house of God. Then he says this, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. I love this because he's writing to Timothy and Timothy has been left in Ephesus. Now in Ephesus, what dominated the city of Ephesus was a temple. It was a house of supposedly a god. It was the temple of Diana, goddess of the Ephesians. Okay, and and this temple dominated the city of Ephesus. In fact, it, it was it took longer to build than any other building in human history at that point. It took two hundred and twenty years to build, in three phases. There were three incarnations of it, if you like. The first phase, it was a, a temple, and then it got made bigger, and then it got, and so the whole lot, 220 years. It was surrounded by 127 pillars that were studded with gold jewels. Isn't that amazing? And yet, this temple that dominated the city of Ephesus, the goddess that was in there, supposedly, was a meteorite that had fallen down from heaven that looked like a many-breasted woman that fitted the idea of the goddess of fertility. But it was a, it was a lump of rock. And so they're worshiping this, in this house of so-called a, a, a divine being. They believed Diana was a goddess. And yet, it's just a lump of rock. It was dead. And compared to that, everything about the house of God is alive. You see, it's the house of the living God, right? He's, he's alive. He's a living deity. He's alive. And Christ is alive. And we're the stones in the house. And guess what kind of stones we are? Living stones. Do you see the picture? Everything about the house of God is alive. Everything about the temple of Diana is death. Here is life. Well, isn't that wonderful? How to behave in the house of God, which is the church in this dispensation, the house of God, previous dispensation, house of God was, was a tabernacle or the house of God was a temple. But in this dispensation, the church is the house of God. It's the church of the living God. And it's the pillar and ground of the truth. And what does that really mean, the pillar and ground of the truth? Well, pillar, uh, again, it's, it's interesting that uh, often were used as support, but they were often means of proclamation. Uh, before the days of Instagram and Twitter and all of the, if you wanted to get a message out, you put it on the pillars of a very important building. Okay, so it was to do with proclamation. Got a message, you stick it on. You remember Martin Luther, he did something. He didn't put it on the pillars, but he put it on the door. Remember that of Wittenberg Church? His 95 thieves, he nailed. Because how else is he going to get the message out? Prominent place, everybody goes there. Stick it in a place where everybody's going to see. Okay, you go to Temple of Diana, you're going to look at those pillars. Right? The church of the living God 
is the pillar of the truth. In other words, it's the place where a message is proclaimed, and that message is the truth. And then the ground is the foundation. Uh, it's uh, the whole structure is built on the idea of the ground, right? You, you usually you dig down, but you you find a firm, you build on a rock, and you uh, and then you build upwards from there. And so it's the idea of foundation. And so the house of God has two purposes really: to proclaim the truth, and as it were, to support the truth, right? Pillar and ground of the truth, to support the truth, to hold the truth, which the whole superstructure rests upon. And so, how do we deal with this? How, how, what are we supposed to learn from this? Well, we already said, why is the house of God essential? Uh, we talked about that in the pandemic, it wasn't considered to be essential, but, but God says it is essential because it's the only place in our society, tragically today, where the truth is proclaimed. Because sadly, you don't get that in school anymore. You don't get that in university anymore. You don't get that in any of these places. And sadly, in a lot of homes, you don't get it anymore. So where are you going to get it? Well, the house of God. That's the place where the truth is proclaimed and defended. And so it's essential because it's the only place. You might not, let me say this, you may not even get the truth in a Bible college or a seminary anymore. Because there's such a movement towards becoming culturally relevant that many of these places become biblically irrelevant because they want to fit in with a culture and a culture that is absolutely at war with God. How can we accommodate that? But we're finding that. So the house of God is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So what, what is the truth? that is so critical to the house of God, if you like, the core truth that has to be proclaimed and defended in connection with the house of God. Well, he says in verse 16, without controversy. In other words, here is something which there should be no controversy about whatsoever. This should be the common confession of the house of God. No dissension is tolerated on this issue. Without controversy, great, that word great is the word mega. You know, you go to McDonald's and if you get mega size, you get the biggest. Well, this is the biggest truth, the greatest mystery, something that has been hidden in previous ages, but now has been revealed. What is this great mystery? Of godliness. How can man, sinful, rebellious man, how can he ever be godly? Is that, is that even a remote possibility? Because in our rebellious state, we're anything but godly, right? So how does that work? How is that, how's that going to, well, he says, you want to know? Well, I'll tell you, it's all about my son. He, that's, it's through him that I can take rebels and sinners and make them like me. Isn't that amazing? That's, that's what the Lord Jesus does. He changes people, doesn't he? He's in the business of transforming lives. And so it's him that does it. It's the Lord Jesus. And so he says, great is the mystery of godliness. And so how does this, how does this all work? He says, well, this. He said, God was manifest in the flesh. Now, I want to just say this. A lot of modern translations say he was manifest in flesh. It doesn't even fit grammatically to say he was manifest. The vast majority of manuscripts, as is usually the case, the vast majority of manuscripts say God was manifest in the flesh. And, and of course, don't we believe that? In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And isn't it a wonderful thing that God took on the additional nature of humanity? God was made flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. God, the invisible God, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. He has told him out. So God was manifested. The idea of manifest is to make, make known, to reveal. He was revealed 
in the one who came in the flesh, the Lord Jesus, the Lord from heaven. And that's the only way a person can ever know God. You remember Philip? He said, Lord, show us the Father, and it will be enough for us. We'll be happy. He says, how long have I been with you, Philip? If you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Because God was manifested in the flesh. And so what a wonderful thing. Now, this, uh, this statement that we're going through here in verse 16, uh, it's kind of interesting uh, that Guy H. King, who's an interesting author, an Anglican, uh, along with the Lord, but, but has some, he's, he's very pithy in his comments. Uh, and he talks about this verse. He says, he said th these lines, he says, they have the rhythm of a hymn and the form of a creed. This is a common confession of the house of God. And, and it's, it's written in such a way, it's got like a rhythm of a hymn. It's got the form of a creed. And we, we certainly can see something of that. Uh, it's, it's beautiful. God was manifest in the flesh. That's kind of the first stanza. Here he was. He came uh, into this world. He, he was manifest in the flesh. It says not only was he manifest in the flesh, he was justified in the spirit. Now, what do we mean by that? We've already seen the invisible God has been made manifest, had been made visible, but then it says justified in the spirit. Uh, so to justify is, is to declare to be right. You see, when the Lord Jesus came into this world and, and he told us who he was, and, and there were people that, that couldn't tolerate that idea that God was his father, for instance. I mean, they just thought, this is abominable teaching. They, they thought he was a blasphemer and all the rest of it. But the Spirit of God vindicated all of the claims of the Lord Jesus. How did he do that? Well, he gave witness to him at his baptism, that he was genuinely the anointed of God, that he was the Messiah. The, the idea of the anointed one is the idea of, of oil put upon the head of somebody who was to be a prophet, priest, and king. And so the Old Testament symbol was this anointing oil that, that set these people apart. Well, it, the oil was symbolic of the Holy Spirit coming upon these men to do something. Well, when it came to the Lord Jesus, it wasn't the oil. It was the Spirit himself that came and descended in bodily form like a dove. So he's vindicated by the Spirit. His claims were not bogus. The Spirit of God vindicated that. Uh, at his resurrection, uh, again, we, we, we see uh, Romans chapter 1, that the spirit of holiness vindicated the claims of Christ. And, of course, the resurrection is one of the greatest evidences for the claims of Christ, uh, that he was who he claimed to be. And in Romans 1 and verses 3 and 4, we'll notice uh, these introductory uh, words to this great gospel uh, revealed to the church at Rome by the Apostle Paul. He says, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. There we got again, God manifest in the flesh. And declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. And the idea is this that the, the Spirit of God was directly involved in raising Christ from the dead. It's interesting that, that the Scripture talks about the Father raising him from the dead. It talks about the Lord Jesus destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And now we've got the Spirit of holiness vindicating the claims of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in all of these things, we have this idea. And, of course, one of the greatest vindications that Christ was who he said he was, was the coming of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. You say, how do you get there? How do you get that? Just look at John 7 for a moment. John chapter 7. And verse 37 through 39. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried and said, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Then notice this. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus 
was not yet glorified. So the coming of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost was dependent on the Lord Jesus being glorified in his ascension, right? And so remember he prayed, Father, glorify me with the glory I had with thee before the world was. Well, when he ascended to glory, that's when he was glorified. And once he was glorified, then the Spirit could come, and he came on the day. So the very coming of the Holy Spirit into this world, into your life, is a vindication that Christ was who he claimed to be. Right? So when he says, that without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, God was manifest in the flesh justified in the spirit in other words all his claims despite the opposition all his claims were declared to be right by the spirit the very fact that he came is evidence that he was who he said he was scene of angels and of course we we can see the angels they were there at the incarnation uh, watching his departure to this earth, no doubt with bated breath and wonder as, as the one who was always in the bosom of the Father, the one that was daily his delight, left his Father's side and came down and took on humanity. And you imagine the angels witnessing all this, scene of angels in his incarnation. They're there declaring it. Uh, seen uh, in the battle royal in the wilderness when he's fighting Satan, it says that afterwards the angels ministered to him, witnessing these great events. Uh, uh, when he was on the cross, he, he said, I, I could have called 12 legions of angels. So that means they were on call. They, they were just waiting. All they wanted to hear was sick them, and that was it, right? They were just waiting. They were witnessing it all, every bit of it, scene of angels at the resurrection. Uh, who's hanging around saying it's an empty tomb? It's the angels, right? He was seen of angels. He was preached to the Gentiles. By the way, are you glad that he was preached to the Gentiles? That's why we're here today, isn't it? That's why you're here this afternoon rather than playing golf because he was preached to the Gentiles. And praise God, not only was he preached to the Gentiles, he was believed on in the world. That's another reason why we're here, because we believed it. We believe that he came into the world. We believe that he went to the cross. We believe that he died. We believe that he was buried. We believe that he rose again victorious. We believe that he ascended to the right hand of the Father. We believe he's coming again. We're here because we believed on him in the world. And we're Gentiles, most of us, unless there's any Jews here. But nevertheless, not, probably all of us are Jew, not Jewish. We're Gentiles. Believed on in the world. Received up into glory. Good place to, to end. Received up into glory. I, I just want to talk a little bit about his ascension. I don't think we make enough of the ascension of Christ. I find it a wonderful, wonderful truth. Just think about it for a second. When he came into this world, what did he receive when he came here? pretty much rejection on every hand at his birth there's no room for him at the inn he has to be born in a, in in a, in a stable uh, and then not just that uh, they try to kill him uh, herod has his all the two year olds and on to try to execute them right so so he's got that then in his own household it says neither did his brethren believe on him so you got rejection in the home he goes to his own synagogue in Nazareth, and he, he, he tells him this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing that, that he's the Messiah, he's the anointed one. What do they do? They try and throw him off a cliff. He goes to the city of the great king, and what do they say? We will not have this man to reign over us. And they crucify him outside the camp. On every hand, rejection, 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 rejection. And then... It says he was received up into glory. Now think about that. Psalm 24, lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be lifted up, you everlasting doors. Why? The king of glory is coming in. You think that's going to be a great reception? King of glory is coming in. And then here's the father, the son that he's always loved, who's been so despised and so, dis so rejected. Here comes the father and he says, come here, son. You sit here at my right hand. You sit here. 
until I make your enemies your footstool. Isn't it great truth that we have to proclaim in the house of God? Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Isn't that wonderful? That he came into this world. That he, that he was justified in the spirit. That he was seen of angels. That he was preached to the Gentiles. That he was believed on in the world. That he was received up into glory. And it's only when you understand this message. Is there any hope for a human being. Of ever remotely being godlike. You reject this message and you reject this person, you will never be like the Lord Jesus and you'll never be like God. You accept this message and believe this person and you like your whole life will be transformed. And ultimately, ultimately, every one of us in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. We're going to see him. And what does it say? And we'll be like him. You will one day be just like the Lord, the Lord Jesus. He is so in love with his son that God wants to fill heaven with people like him. And we're going to be one of those. <laughs> That's an amazing thing. That, but we don't have to wait till the rapture to be like him. You see, as we allow the word of God to change us, we can become more like him every single day when we embrace that doctrine that is according to godliness it will produce christ-like character in all of our lives and that's what the world needs to see more people who remind them of the lord jesus and so again timothy's message or paul's message to timothy vital message it's it's behavior in the house of god it, it's the importance of the defense of the truth in the house of God, the proclamation of the truth from the house of God. He said, Timothy, you got to get this. The house of God is essential. A liquor store will never make you godly. In fact, it will make you so wild and wicked that you'll be so different from what God ever intended for you to be. All these things that are supposedly essential in our culture are not going to make you like the Lord Jesus. The only place you'll ever hear this message, sadly, today is the house of God. It's essential. It's essential. Let's pray. Our Father, we just continue to look to thee to help us throughout this day. Uh, we want to grasp the meaning of this epistle, and we want to be greatly affected by it. Father, deliver us from just intellectualism, from just getting more information, more facts, being walking Bible dictionaries. Lord, we want to be like your son. Uh, we want to be like you. We want to be godly. And uh, Lord, not fleshly, not manly or womanly in the sense of how the world views these things but we want to be how you would have us to be, just shaped, formed, changed by the scriptures into thy likeness. We'll give thee all the praise and all the glory in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Snacks on the other side, along with some coffee and uh, water. So we can make our way over there and we'll be back at four. Four o'clock, we'll start the next session, okay?